Hey guys, welcome to EMS Challenge. We're down at the Alabama uh, Association of Rescue Squad Conference in Orange Beach. If you're in the Orange Beach area, we're going to do a skills lab at 10 o'clock. Feel free to come on out. I appreciate them inviting us down today. So thanks for being here and being awake at 8 o'clock in the morning on the beach. Not many folks do that because of the night before. Just saying for a friend, right? Right. That's <laughs> right. All right. So for those of you that are uh, new online or in person, EMS Challenge was started about 2014 to bring more physician-led Con Ed into the uh, Birmingham region. Uh, thanks to the support of the Fire College, we're now moving that out statewide. Uh, we're reaching about 200 people uh, a session these days uh, and looking to get more involved. Uh, currently have two fellows at UAB. Those are UAB attendings that do EMS work and the residency program supporting us with our skills labs and lectures. Uh, so hopefully get more physicians involved. But um, EMS Challenge was uh, created to improve the Con Ed process for the state of Alabama. For your certificate in person, you can scan the QR code or take it to a link you can fill out. Online, you'll get a link posted to you in the chat box, or if you get confused, no worries, email us at alabamaemschallenge at gmail.com and you'll get your certificate. Try to get that done by today. Upcoming events, uh, December 8th. Remember, November, December is different. We don't do our twice a month class. Um, do the holidays. So next class will be December 8th. That's the second Wednesday of December. We'll be at Brim's 9 to 11. And then we'll have skill lab that afternoon. We'll be advanced airway, surgical airway. Maybe do some ultrasound that day as well. I'm not sure yet when to hear. On the 16th, uh, we'll be back with Dr. Kurt. Uh, he is the uh, EMS researcher at UAB that's spoken with us before talking about research opportunities and how to interpret research. It's actually exciting, so don't miss that one. He does a good job, he keeps you awake better than I do. Um, our 2022 calendar will be out, uh, hopefully by the end of December, we'll have our uh, uh, way uh, locations uh, noted. Don't forget our YouTube channel is uh, up and running. If you want Con Ed, uh, National Registry says that you can do uh, uh, video uh, Con Ed uh, through the 2022 cycle. You can't get Con Ed for that, so it's pretty useful. Um, and then we uh, hopefully through our residents and fellows, we can start a podcast uh, that gives you just snippets of content. So let's talk about uh, the EMT. Uh, so if you look at the scope of practice for the EMT for the state and at the national level, it's actually pretty high. So I took an EMT course 31, 32 years ago. Uh, it was uh, with the Vicksburg Fire Department. I was never a firefighter, let me clarify. So I took it with those guys. Uh, it was a pretty rapid summer long course uh, but if you think about the things that you learn as an emt it's pretty impressive so there are a lot of things out there we used to call the emt basic uh there's did we lose me okay yeah so emt used to be called the basic emt and i'll, I'll say there's really nothing basic about that right um the skills that you got to do to be a, a efficient emt uh is, is pretty technical if you look at some of the things that we're doing now, uh, just the first one, patient assessment. Uh, that's something that uh, in med school, these guys get four years of this. So they start off year one learning patient assessment. They call it introduction to clinical medicine. And it's a one year course. They repeat second year, third year, and fourth year. So we're expecting EMTs to take one semester of training to go out there and be able to recognize sick versus not sick. So the responsibility that the EMT has these days is pretty great. Um, is, is there's no such thing as a basic EMT. When I think about patient assessment, I think about the ABCs, right? So I think about a neurostatus. I use APU mnemonic. I keep it fairly simple. Um, obviously, when we teach our res residents, we talk about these big differentials, things they can think about for altered mental status. Um, but in the world that you practice in, in the world that I practice in, we've got to keep it kind of straightforward. We do our assessment <clears throat> as we get our physical, as we intervene on people so people don't die. So I use the APU mnemonic, so for alert, verbal, pain, or unresponsive. Obviously, if they're alert, I feel pretty comfortable. That gives me more time to step back, reassess the situation, the scene, maybe get history from the family members that are there. Um, if they're unresponsive, unrespond to painful stimulus, that lets me know they're super sick, they're critically ill. Those people get a quick early hands-on ABC. You expose the patient, you're looking for life threats, and you call them for transport or ALS care. So that part, fairly simple, right? So respiratory rate, how do you count respiratory rate? So in the hospital, when I look at vital signs that the nurses take, you know, people have a couple of different respiratory rates. They even have zero when they're dead, right? 
If their complaint is shortness of breath or something respiratory, they usually put 30 something and everything else in between is usually 14, right? And the point of that statement is nobody actually counts respiratory rate. Anybody here actually count respiratory rate for a whole minute? Raise your hand. Oh, you're good because I can't do it. My ADHD kicks in and I start thinking about fishing or squirrels, my next cup of coffee. I can't do it. I think more important than respiratory rate is work of breathing. They, uh, they took a study, they did, uh, they took a med student, a nurse, and an uh, ED tech, and they had them all three count respiratory rates on the same patients, moving from one room to room. And what they found out is that everybody counts it a little bit different, right? So the number is not super important. Now, obviously, less than six is bad, right? More than 30 is bad. Everything in between is kind of relative, right? And everybody's also pretty nervous when you guys show up on scene and they call for help. I think work of breathing is more important. Are they using accessory muscles? Are they sitting upright? It's a nasal flaring, okay? What is their neurological status? Are they awake and talking to you? That, that's been able to breathe an okay-ish at that point as well. So work of breathing is more important than rate of breathing, okay? When you think about getting blood pressures and uh, heart rates, I think touching the patient is very important. So I'm laying hands on that person as I'm looking at the respiratory rate. If you want to get a number, I do the six second rule. So I watch them and I see how many times they breathe in six seconds and I multiply that by 10. I'm from Mississippi. I can multiply by 10. I can't do any other multiplication or math. It doesn't work out very well, right? But if they're breathing three times a minute and I go six times three is 18, the rate's okay-ish, all right? And then I kind of look at their work of breathing. I'm laying hands on them and I'm looking for fusion status. So if their skin warm and dry, my hands on the radial pulse. If they have a radial pulse, I know the blood pressure is what, at least. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's good, right? So textbooks say 90, it could be 90, it could be 100, it could be high, but the good thing is they're not hypotensive, so you got a few minutes, right? So hands on them, I'm getting a good pulse rate. I'm not getting heart rate off a cardiac monitor. I want a pulse rate. Are they warm, are they dry, are they mentating okay? I'm looking at work of breathing, all right? And if they got a great pulse rate, I can always come back in a few minutes and get a blood pressure on those guys as well. Does that make sense or am I rambling too much with my coffee? Sweet. <laughs> Central versus peripheral pulses. If you've ever had PALS or any of the pediatric courses that talk about that, sometimes it's tough to get peripheral pulses on kids. You can do the same theory on adults as well. All right. So if they have no radial pulse, the next thing I'm doing, I'm moving up to the carotids. I'm moving down to the groin to feel for a pulse. If they're talking to me, they obviously have a pulse, right? <clears throat> but moving toward the groin or toward the neck, looking for that. Then after I get that, can I start stabilizing the patient? If they're diaphoretic, if their pulse is fast, I can't get a good radial, but I can get a carotid and they're hypotensive. I don't have access to IV fluids or anything. I may raise their legs up a little bit. I'm already calling for backup ALS support, maybe an advanced DMT, get IV access. Skin perfusion. So skin perfusion is pretty important as well. You can look to see are they blue, are they hypoxic, are they mottled, are they ashen? This works really good on kids. There's something out there called the pediatric assessment triangle. That video takes me into a deep wandering there. Let's just get your hands on the patient. But there's something called the uh, pediatric assessment triangle. Uh, it's uh, a general appearance of the kid, work of breathing, not rate, and circulation. And that's pretty useful on young folks, right? So if the person is age appropriate, acting normal, probably have good neuro status at that point in the game, work of breathing we kind of talked about, and then skin circulation. So Kids are great. They don't have the 40 years of cigarettes and cheeseburgers like the rest of us do, right? But even in adults, you can pick up clues, right? So the model person, are they pale? That makes you think anemia or a blood loss. Good way to go with that. And then temperature. And, you know, uh, textbooks, things we learned in EMT and paramedic school talks about you want to get a temperature on people. In the field, who actually has a thermometer? Yeah, in the ER, we don't have a lot of those either, right? So it's general appearance in these kids, right? Are these adults hands on them? Are they frozen or they feel hot? Everything else in between really does not matter for us as far as our assessment goes in these people, right? Other things that the EMT scope or practice, but just the assessment part is something that takes years to get. Uh, you know, uh, one semester course, if you don't repractice, relearn these skills, you're not going to do a good job. So administration of O2. All right, we talk about uh, giving aspirin for chest pain. You got to understand the risk to benefit for that. Using airways, something we've added in our state recently is blind insertion airway devices for the EMT. And I even have medics now that are going straight to that and only intubating if those things don't work. It's like cheating, okay? We're going to play with those in a little bit. 
Um, you do have to use capnography for that, <clears throat> capnography. BVM, these are all skills that in the hospital, we don't let our dogs do this, and this is a supervising position around. But these are things that we're doing in the pre-hospital field, right, or area. So these are very important skills to master. People can die if we don't do these well. Very important. Other things we think about is uh, CPAP. Anybody here using CPAP? So we got some folks using CPAP as well. CPAP is great. Uh, EMT can also use BiPAP. The difference is that is with CPAP is continuous positive airway pressure. It's great for COPD, for asthmatics. It's really great for CHF, pulmonary edema. It does positive pressure with the mass that's put on there. BiPAP is bi-level, so you get two rates. So when they breathe in, they get a certain number, and when they breathe out, you keep some of that pressure there to keep their airways open as well. The problem with BiPAP in the pre-hospital world is you gotta have a ventilator, and those things cost more than my first car, right? Um, so with good funding, we can do that, but right now we're kind of limited. We also think about capnography. So capnography, you gotta use capnography using a blind insertion device. So that's a new skill that we gotta incorporate into the EMP training. <laughs> for us. And there's some new medications coming out there. <clears throat> so we kind of talked about physical exam, hands on the patient, general appearance, the APU, are they sick or not sick? If they're not sick, we're going to start calling for transport, getting some assistance coming to them. And then as we're doing our assessment, you know, in, in med school, we teach them to do a physical exam, you get their history, do them at separate times. I do it all at once, just like y'all do, right? So I'm taking my history as my hands are on the patient. And the purpose of a good history is to risk stratify, determine is the patient sick or not sick, you need to expedite transport, what's going on with those things. So there's some things that matter, I call them STM, stuff that matters, right? So there's some acute care chest pain STM. So if I have a 40 year old patient with chest pain, all right, the questions I may ask them is, you know, obviously, have you ever had a heart attack before? If they say yes, it makes me more concerned about their underlying heart disease, right? Okay. So the questions I ask kind of risk stratify them, okay? The guy with 40-year-old chest pain, have you been smoking some cocaine? That could be a cause of this. Things that make me think either better or worse, have they ever been seen by a physician for that before? If they have, what was the problem? They say, yeah, I get chest pain all the time. They say it's GERD. I'm going to feel a little bit better about that patient. I'm still going to work them up, but I feel a little bit safer about their exam and history. Does that make sense? You know, I don't really care. Everybody in Alabama is hypertensive and diabetic. Everybody takes a blue pill, a yellow pill. They got the Walmart bag full of stuff, right? But the questions I want to ask are things that are important. Um, <clears throat> anybody uh, ever heard of uh, blood thinners, Coumadin? Yeah, Zeralto? Yeah. So those things put people at a higher risk. So if I got a person that has fallen, tripped and fallen, they hit their head, the first question I'm going to ask them is, are you on blood thinners, right? Because it risk stratifies them. If they're on a blood thinner, higher risk for bad outcome. That person needs to be evaluated. They can get a CAT scan in any ER in the state. So that's the purpose of all these questions, all right? And I also got the uh, don't forget the underlying physiology. That's an inappropriate phrase if you say it with just the first letters, but it makes you remember it, right? All right, so things like that. So tourniquets, so if someone has an acute injury to the arm, right? So they get an amputation mid forearm. Where's the tourniquet go? Anybody know? high and tight, right? I can't tell you how many times I see him put down on the, just below the elbow. It doesn't work. You gotta remember the underlying pathophysiology and anatomy, right? You got two bones, you put a tourniquet over it, it's not gonna occlude that artery, right? So you wanna be high and tight, okay? Has anybody ever seen a tourniquet put on the neck? Raise your hand. Anybody ever put one on the neck? Yes. You want to, yes sir, that's just your family though. You can't do that, you go to jail for that. No comment, right? Yeah, you laugh, I laugh, I've seen a tourniquet a a Spanish type tourniquet put on someone's neck before for a mass and a carotid bleed. So you got to remember those things, right? And obviously nobody here is going to do that. We joke about it, but I'm telling you those things happen out there. So I always think about underlying pathophysiology. One of the bad things about folks who go to med school is after about eight years of classroom, you lose some of your common sense, right? Uh, and they rely on us to make sure we keep our common sense and don't do stupid things to our patients, right? So thanks for smiling on that one. All right. So airway skills, airway skills are very important. You know, you keep it simple. The things that I learned in that EMT, can't, EMT class 30 something years ago, I still do today. So medicine is the ABCs repeated over and over again on a patient, just adding different medicines, tools and drugs and skills that you have, right? So anytime I go to intubate somebody in the hospital, I have an oral airway in my pocket. 
So if I can't get an advanced airway, I can go back, slide that oral airway in, way in them and ventilate them. So very important things to do. So OPAs, nasal trumpets, anybody use a nasal trumpet still? Yeah, those are fantastic. As long as there's no facial trauma, they work great. If the person is uh, semi-alert or they're really not unconscious and they're just looking for attention, and you put a nasal trumpet in them, what happens to them? They wake up pretty quick and snatch that out, right? So it's a good way to check neurostatus too, right? So I like nasal trumpets on folks with seizures. They have a seizure. I get on scene. I put in some supplemental O2. I do a jaw thrust. They're still a little bit hypoxic. I put a nasal trumpet in. The good thing is when they start coming out of that postictal state, they'll reach up and pull that out, and I feel a lot better. It gives me a lot of information. So we'll play with some nasal trumpets today as well. Anybody here using the King device, King Airway? Anybody still using those? Got them on the truck? Yeah. So the King is a great blind insertion device. It's approved for EMTs to use as well. It's sort of like the old combi tube, right? So basically you lubricate it up and I lubricate it with their own vomit usually, right? You can put some KY jelly on there or you can dip it in their mouth. Um, don't put it in your mouth first because that was kind of weird. And everything we do is also recorded these days, right? So lubricate it, you gently slide it in, you inflate the cuff, and then you ventilate. If you're using one of these, the patient should get better after you put a blind insertion device in. That means their SAT should improve, the heart rate should get better, get better, their color should improve. If you have capnography, that should be on there too, and you should get waveform capnography. The benefit for the King is they're quick, they're easy. The disadvantages are you get that big freaking balloon. So there's some pretty good data that in cardiac arrest, if you put this in, you inflate that balloon, if you're doing CPR, it's gonna limit the blood flow back to the heart, back to the brain. So I'm not a big fan of Kings. If you got them, they're fine, you can use them. Um, I'm more of a fan of the eye gels. Um, these are redneck proof, right? So I really can't mess these up. I've messed them up, but I recognize it, trust me, right? So these are blind insertion devices, and basically what happens is the, <clears throat> this material on the tip, here is made of a material that when it gets warm, will kind of suction to tissues. So you lubricate this, you place it gently in the mouth hole. It should sit over the glottic opening. If the patient is alive and warm, that should kind of suction there. You should be able to ventilate, right? And oxygenate them pretty good. Again, like anything else, if this goes in, they should get better, right? SAT should improve. You should have capnography. Some of the new ones have a tube here that goes to the very end. That in theory, you can put a small gastro tube in if you're an advanced, uh, if you're a paramedic. In reality, what that really does is just allows it, the air to vent out of the stomach. Okay. What happens though? This patient is now cardiac arrest, big belly full of food. You put this in, and every compression, vomit starts pouring out of the LMA. What do you do with that after you use profanity in your brain? Take it out. Yeah, it's not working, right? So you got to take them out, suction the airway, turn them on the side, do something different. And we're going to play with some vomit in a mannequin here in a little while, too. I like vomit. Let's see if this video will come up for us. So this is the eye gel. Super easy to use. If it fits in the mouth, it works. You want it to kind of be a little bit tight. You slide it in, you get the first tension and the second. It's got a natural bite block on it and then you can ventilate through there. Works very well. Obviously they can't have a gag reflex. They have to be out of it, right? So this is your opiate overdose. This is your trauma patient with a bad head injury. But you can tell that you have entitled CO2, that yellow line. So we know that we're getting oxygenation and ventilation on them. I better change the slide before we go to something weird. Next YouTube. Yeah, that's <laughs> but key things, any airway that you use, even though we're talking about EMTs, these are advanced airways, the blind insertion devices. Uh, I got medics using these things. In the hospital, when COVID first hit, any cardiac arrest, they asked us not to intubate them. They asked us to put a blind insertion device in. We we'll cover the patient with a towel to prevent spread of disease, right? And ventilate them. Um, I'm still a big fan that you, if you're a medic or uh, above our critical care, that you get these things out and get them intubated. Uh, but they do work well uh, as long as you're getting good sets and capnography works from those.
got to have cat pornography. Anybody like cats? Oh, good. We got two cat people. Good. That's good. Well, you, well, I can't tell that story. I'm being recorded. Never mind. They get me in trouble. All right. So first case. This is a uh, young male. Uh, complaints of shortness of breath for two days. He's uh, fairly obese. Uh, says he's been just short of breath, and now he's just worse. So uh, heart rates that should be a little bit higher. We we'll say his heart rate's in the mid 90s. He's breathing fast. I do the six second rule, and he's breathing like six times in that. So he's breathing breathing 30 times a minute, breathing really fast. Sats are in the 88% range. All right. And blood pressure, he's got a bounding radial pulse. Somebody signs a blood pressure on there. Blood pressure is like 220 over 115. So I know that's a typical number for blood pressure for somebody in Alabama, but I would say that is still abnormal, right? So he's breathing fast, sats are low, blood pressure is up. So I'm gonna get hands on this patient. I'm gonna sit him upright. I'm gonna look at him. I'm gonna listen. He's got crackles. He sounds like he's got fluid in his lungs. His legs are big and swollen. Okay, and he's pretty anxious. So what could be going on with this guy? What kind of questions would we want to ask him? The STMs that I use. That picture is for Chief Ward. He loves Oprah. He's a big Oprah fan. Yeah, think about CHF. Right. So he's got. He's got fluid on his lungs. He's got big swollen legs. He's already hypertensive. He's obese. So he probably has underlying hypertension and diabetes. Both of those lead to congestive heart failure. What else could be going on with him? Could be having a heart attack. Yeah, could have a big heart attack. And now the heart's not pumping well. And that's why he's fluid. Yeah, slow heart rate. Yeah, so a lot of things could be going on this guy. But the questions I would think about ask is, you know, one, hey, man, you ever had a heart attack or a stroke? If he says yes, then you're really thinking toward congestive heart failure. If you want to be quicker on your time, be efficient, say, hey, you got a history of heart failure, right? Other questions you might want to ask this guy, maybe he's got kidney problems, right? So maybe he's got a big dialysis graph sitting there. So, hey, this ever happened before? Do you get short-winded like this? What medicines do you take? If he says a blue pill and a yellow pill, I quit asking. That doesn't help me at all, right? But if he says I take a fluid pill, that gives me a big hint, probably got some heart failure, right? So I agree. This guy, he's got heart failure, right? He's got pulmonary edema for some reason. Either he's got back congestive heart failure, he's got kidney problems, he's fluid volume overloaded. I'm not a big mnemonic guy. Uh, I like the ABCs. I remember those, right? And then the other one I like is LMNOP. Uh, and this is how I treat people who have pulmonary edema or congestive heart failure. And I start at the bottom and work my way up. So P is for position and pressure, right? So one of the things that I see in the hospital, I'll see EMS bring somebody in that has bad heart failure, fluid pump, uh, pulmonary edema. They got the patient great. They're sitting upright, doing the right thing. We switch, switch them over to our stretcher. And the first thing the doctor and the nurse does is we lay them back down, scoot them up in bed and start our assessment. And folks with pulmonary edema cannot lay flat, right? They don't do well with that. So the way you treat them is you sit them upright and you never lay them flat again, right? So you sit them upright, Right. And what that does is you think about the fluid in the lungs. <clears throat> if they're almost completely full and you sit them upright, you still have some lungs at the top you can aerate. Right. You can get oxygenation and ventilation. Problem is, if you lay them back flat, if you think about where the trachea is, the trachea is about midway, midline through the body. So you lay them back. This fluid layers out and they get no air whatsoever. You can actually put them in a cardiac arrest. They can die from that. I would argue that on scene or in the hospital, if somebody has pulmonary edema, before you start moving them, you sit them up, right? And you don't lay them back to move, transport, stair stretcher, whatever you got, <clears throat> or stair chair. You get them upright so they can breathe. Very important. So position is important. You sit them right up. What else can you do? What could else can you do for this person in addition to sitting them upright? CPAP. Yeah, CPAP is like cheating, man. So CPAP and BiPAP is saving people with kidney problems that get pulmonary edema from going to the ICU to get dialysis. We can use these CPAP, BiPAP them, and they get better pretty quick. So how does CPAP work? Anybody know? Anybody care? 8.20 in the morning on the beach? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, it sure does. So it increases pressure inside the lungs. It pushes this fluid out, okay? The other thing that it does, it's pretty cool, is it lowers blood pressure, right? So if this guy's got a blood pressure 220 over 115, we know he's got pulmonary edema. He's a big obese guy, probably has heart failure too, right? So that big blood pressure makes where the heart can't pump the blood out of the lungs. 
If I lower his blood pressure, the heart can pump more fluid out and get it out of the lungs. So CPAP, BiPAP lowers blood pressure and pushes the air, the uh, fluid out of the lungs. So it works great. I would even argue that if you don't see him with somebody, instead of trying to rapidly transport them, you sit them upright, you put some CPAP on them, and you give them 10 or 15 minutes, and they're more stable to get in the ambulance or the rescue to get to the hospital, and they don't go into cardiac arrest for you. So the O is for oxygen, and yes, I know that American Heart is not a big oxygen fan these days. They say if you're not hypoxic, SATs are greater than 92%, you don't need O2. I would argue that this guy probably needs O2. He's breathing fast and he's hypoxic. There's pretty good data that high flow O2 on somebody for like a whole day is bad for them, uh, but so is anything else, right? Um, but oxygen in the environment that you work in, in the place that I work in, is not bad for people. I don't call it supplemental oxygen. I call it pre-oxygenation. And this guy gets <clears throat> high flow O2. Well, you say that high flow was just a mask, non-rebreather. In reality, a non-rebreather, and unless that bag is deflating every time they breathe, you're probably not getting 99, 100%, right? So if they tolerate a nasal cannula, put a nasal cannula in them, crank it up to 15 liters, and that does pretty well, okay? We're using a lot of high flow O2 in the hospital these days by nasal cannula, and it works pretty good. Nitro, what does nitro do for people? So EMTs, advanced EMTs can give nitro if the patient has it, all right? If they have underlying heart disease, by asking that question, you know they have the medication, you can start reaching for it to assist them in taking it. And you assist them by opening it up, putting it in your hand and popping it in their mouth hole, right? Very good. What does nitro do? Yeah, dilates the vessels. Yeah, so nitro dilates the vessels. It also lowers blood pressure. So it works just like the CPAP. It also dilates those vessels and makes that fluid move to other places besides the lungs. And that's the goal. We want the fluid out of the lungs so they can breathe and they don't die right then and there. Sweet. So two other things we can use, the M and the L is morphine and Lasix. So morphine is something that you can use as a medic or above. Uh, morphine is a narcotic. It takes them from saying, I'm short of breath, I don't feel good. To, I'm short of breath, I don't feel good, but I don't really care, right? So they get high. Uh, but it also, morphine is an older narcotic. It causes a histamine release. It makes them drop their blood pressure, right? So that's why it's a contraindication for morphine to be hypotensive to give it. So morphine works pretty good, lowers blood pressure, helps that way. Lasix is a diuretic, it helps them pee off the issues, get that fluid out. The problem with Lasix is it takes a couple of hours to kick in and really do a good job. The other problem is if it kicks in sooner, they're doing what? They're peeing in the back of your rescue, which is probably not a good thing either. So um, hopefully uh, with new protocol changes, Lasix is going to category A for the state, uh, be more useful. Uh, but for me personally, what I'm doing with CHF pulmonary team is I'm doing position and pressure. I'm going to sit them upright. I'm going to pop a nitro under their tongue, make sure I got high flow O2, put the CPAP or BiPAP on them. And I'm not going to move them till they're breathing better. If he's breathing 40 times a minute, hypertensive on scene, I'm going to give the nitros, the CPAP, the BiPAP, the O2 a few minutes to work before I make this 300 pound dude try to get up or get in a soft stretcher and start moving to the rescue. Okay, because when he gets to the hospital, okay, I'm going to do the same thing that you can do, which is position O2 and nitro. Does that make sense? Am I rambling too much? I need more coffee. Talk about CPAP or BiPAP be used at the EMT level. Contraindications would be obviously if they're hypotensive, that's a bad sign. You don't want to use CPAP. The other thing is if they're altered and confused and vomiting, you can't put a mask on their face because they can vomit through there. But if this same guy was altered, confused, hypertensive, breathing bad, you may have to sit him upright, pop the nitro, and then stand behind him with your BVM and give him some CPAP that way or positive pressure and just give it a few minutes and hopefully his mentation will improve with some of that and then you can put the CPAP on him. Does that make sense? Because this guy, if you lay him back flat and try to bag him with the OPA or nasal trumpet, what's gonna happen? He's gonna go into cardiac arrest. So this is the guy, you may take a few extra minutes, you may get behind him, you sit him up, you pop that nitro in him, you put a nasal trumpet in, you put your mask over and you assist ventilations for a few minutes and maybe three, four, eight minutes later, now he's mentating better now you take that off, put that CPAP mask on there, a few more minutes, and then maybe it's to the point where you can transport at that point in the game, okay? Again, the big point here is these guys are pretty unstable. You want to stay on scene and manage it best you can. 
to make them safe to transport. Inappropriate humor to wake you up. And everybody must be drowsy because nobody's laughing. So we'll move on to the next case. Um, so this was a uh, 20-ish year old male. Uh, it was uh, Saturday after a football game. I won't say which teams were playing. Uh, he was picked up by EMS at a local spot where they use heroin. Uh, the call was for altered mental, altered mental status in a car. Uh, they get on scene. The dude is a little bit diaphoretic. Heart rate is 110. Blood pressure was a little bit soft, but he had a good radial pulse. Wrapped up in a jacket, had a <clears throat> hoodie on. Respirations were eight. Thinking about the reasons that make you altered, they got a quick Accu check, and it was 64. They squirted some Narcan up his nose. Didn't work and put a nasal airway in, started bagging the guy, and we're bringing him in. Uh, the call was for opiate overdo overdose. Uh, however, in route to the hospital, he became bradycardic, kind of went in PEA, and then cardiac arrest when he got to me. So, why did Narcan not work for this guy? What now? I'm sorry. So sugar is a little bit low. If I'm 64, y'all doing CPR on me, right? There's no way. So textbook says less than 60, 64. That guy probably would have gained a little bit of glucose as well. Doesn't explain his blood pressure, but it does explain his altered mental status. So glucose doesn't help the guy. Narcan didn't help the guy. What else could be going on with him? Or what else you want to do for this guy? Cut off his Alabama shirt and burn it, maybe? No, I'm joking. That was kind of funny. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so if you're uh, advanced or a medic, yeah, fluid challenge. I'll be fluid. It's gonna be going with this guy. Um, I guess my point to this is: the, is the guy sick or not sick? He's sick. So this guy's gonna be taken out of the vehicle. He's gonna be laid on the ground. You're gonna raise his head up, reposition the airway. You cut his clothes off. You expose him. He's unstable. You're looking for life threats as you treat the guy. So I pull him out, open the airway nasal Narcan, grab an Anbu bag, start ventilating if somebody's cutting clothes off and looking for an issue, okay? If you're able to give IV fluids, IV fluids and glucose is fine, all right? So this guy actually, when he got to us, uh, he was still in his clothes, completely clothed. They had just started CPR. So we threw him down, we cut his clothes off and we found a hole under his arm. So he had been at a local spot to get some heroin and he actually got shot in the chest instead. And that was missed because nobody exposed the patient. OK, now outcome for this guy would have been the same. It was probably a fatal wound to begin with. Right. However, I can tell you the crew that brought that guy in felt bad about it because they missed the fact that he had a acute lead poisoning. Right. Sweet. All right. So this was a 50 year old male. The call is for altered mental status. Final signs, he's a little bit tacky. 124 and he's breathing about five times every six seconds so a little bit fast he's got an increased work of breathing using accessory muscles he's got a weak radial pulse kind of sweaty blood pressure is 95 over 60. he's setting 96 percent he keeps saying ethyl maybe it was earl i can't remember a little bit combative but he can't beat you up he's too weak to beat you up so what do you want to do for this guy Yeah, so yeah, so yeah, I would check a sugar, right? So you get a glucose on this guy. I'm gonna be asking family questions that matter. This ever happened before, any health problems, right? I'm gonna expose him, I'm gonna look for life threats, I'm gonna look for patches, for holes, things that can make a big difference, right? And then you said it as well, check a glucose. The one lab test we can do in the field is pretty important, right? So when I get a glucose on this guy, it reads high. Anybody here got uh, nasal capnography? Can you use nasal capnography? Yeah, so that's like cheating, right? So this guy's breathing 30 plus times a minute. His O2 saturation is fine, but his entitled CO2 is like, nah, what's going on with him? He's in DKA, yeah, exactly, he's in DKA. People say you can't diagnose DKA in the field. Actually, you can, right? So he's breathing fast, but he's not hypoxic, all right? His entitled was nine, his D-stick is high. So he's DKA, exactly. So sick or not sick? 
super sick. This guy can die pretty quick. So this is somebody you're gonna, if you're uh, non-transport or BLS, you can be calling in to get some help, get out there. When I think about getting a blood glucose from somebody, you get three results. You get a low, you get a high, or something in between. If it's low, I can fix it, right? So if I'm a medic, I can give uh, dextrose. If I'm an EMT, I can do some oral glucose. Even if they're altered, I can send them up, put some of that in there as I'm calling for ALS. <clears throat> if it reads high, I know they got one of three things going on. They're just a regular Alabamian who had too many donuts for breakfast, but that person's usually talking to you and not looking well. I mean, it, lo it looks pretty good. <clears throat> if, they're if their glucose is high and they're breathing fast and they look ill, they're in diabetic ketoacidosis. If their glucose is high and they're talking to you, uh, the third thing they can have is they can have what's called hyperosmolar. Those folks usually aren't breathing fast. They're usually tachycardic and dehydrated, but they're not acidotic, so they won't be breathing fast. So it gives you a lot of information right there. Perfect. So DKA is basically when you, the pancreas is not making enough insulin. They can't work the glucose in. They get pretty acidotic. They get dehydrated. These guys are usually a couple liters down on fluid. And the biggest thing that kills them early on is hyperkalemia. Normally with hyperkalemia, you think about a slow rhythm. They get bradycardic and a YQRS complex. But folks in DKA get pre-tachycardic, uh, and they can go into dysrhythmias pretty fast. So as a medic, yes, there's 12 leads right there. So this is a EKG on somebody in DKA. The machine would read this as VTAC, but if you look at it, we've got PT waves, YQRS, the rate's actually not 300, the rate's about 140. So for the medics in here, how would you treat this as a medic? Any medics? Bueller? Turn the monitor off. Turn the monitor off, yes. <laughs> That's right. No apply anyway. Yeah. Yeah, so bicarb is reasonable. I think aggressive IV fluid resuscitation. If the guy says, I have heart failure, I'm like, no worries. I'll sit them up and I start the fluids. Their way volume down, all right? They need calcium to help protect the heart, all right? If I was an EMT or an advanced, I couldn't get IV access, or even a medic and couldn't get IV access. There's a drug I can give this patient to make them better too. What else can I give them? So they're probably not glucagon. Glucagon will make their sugars get higher, yeah. Yeah, plus you get in trouble. That stuff costs so much money. If you use it, it's 167 bucks a pop, man. What else can you give them? Anybody know? No, I want to give them nitro because they're tachycardic for a reason. I want to give them nitro and I drop their heart rate and blood pressure, they'll get sicker because they need that rate to keep the cardiac output. So how about albuterol? So albuterol is great for hyperkalemia. If I got somebody that's uh, in DKA, tachycardic, looks like dirt, it would be kind of counterintuitive to think albuterol because it makes your heart rate go up. But if they're KSI and you got EKG changes, albuterol will switch that K back into the cell and works pretty good. The dose is 20 milligrams, so you give them about four of your NEB treatments and you just stick that on their face and let it ride out till you get IV access and you do something different. So albuterol. If you got dual NEBs, you can use that as well. The atrovent won't hurt them, it won't help them, but it won't hurt them. The goal is to get a bunch of albuterol in those guys. Yes, sir. Call and get orders because I don't know, you know, right in a rural area, I don't know whether my correct, you know. So the yeah. doc would sign off on it if I just category A. Right. So I think that's a discussion you have with your offline medical director. I'm so, sorry. So the so the so the folks on the on the web, the question is albuterol is probably not cat A for hyperkalemia. Can you give it? And the answer would be, um, if you think that your med control at the hospital is not going to be comfortable doing that, go ahead and have a discussion with your offline medical director now so that you have backup if you can't reach him or her and that need arises. There's limited risk to albuterol for anybody. And the only risk would be if I have a 90-year-old guy with heart disease and I give him albuterol, heart rate can get up faster, they can have a big heart issue, right? But if you know what the diagnosis is, DKA, and you recognize the fact they're hyperkalemic, they need that albuterol if you can't do anything else. Okay. Right. Transport time to the hospital. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, you know, to get them to an ICU. So right. Yes, sir. 
Right. So I think that's a discussion to have with the developer director now so that you got back up from them if you have to do that. Yes, sir. So I'll do that. Right. One of the good things for those of you that came to the uh, EMS conference, uh, I guess it was last week, is that one of the things we're trying to do now that's being presented to the health uh, department is making most everything category A. So if you have if you have a major diagnosis, which I know we're not supposed to say that you guys do that, but you actually should, right? Um, then you can go ahead and go down that pathway and albuterol is a treatment for hyperkalemia. So hopefully that'll be fixed soon. But if not, the way you correct that now is meet with your medical director and you have that backup plan if you can't reach your online hospital. Hey, Doc. Yes, sir. Hey, we had one question come in about <clears throat> albuterol uh, being also dangerous for acute congestive heart failure. Thoughts on that? So I think that it's probably, the, <laughs> I wouldn't say dangerous. There's a risk and a benefit to every drug. But albuterol had been used in the past for heart failure because people talked about a cardiac wheeze, right? But what you're really hearing with somebody who has that cardiac wheeze and congestive heart failure is fluid in the airways and it's not bronchial constriction, right? So there's probably not much benefit for albuterol, but I want to say it's dangerous for them. The other thing to think about is what is a cause of uh, congestive heart failure? Yeah, hypertension maybe, maybe smoking, right? So it's pretty common that I have somebody that has COPD and has congestive heart failure, right? So if I think it's a mixed picture, then I'm gonna give them albuterol, atrovent, combo mix, and treat them with the position pressure upright, CPAP, BiPAP. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think when I think about albuterol, I think about a couple of things. The risk would be increasing the heart rate on somebody so that they have a big heart event. So if my concern is for a STEMI, and my concern is that they're an older person with underlying bad heart disease and I get them tachycardic and now they have chest pain, I don't want to do albuterol. The other big concern for albuterol is if I give somebody albuterol all day long for their bad asthma attack, their potassium will eventually drop so low they can have problems with that as well. Cool. In the hospital, we give them IV fluids, calcium. We do a little bit of insulin, the sodium bicarb y'all mentioned. Uh, so, Y'all can diagnose DKA in the field. Remember the things that kill people early on in DKA would be volume depletion, all right, hypotension, issues like that, and hyperkalemia. So always think about that. Just a couple of cool pictures. This is a CAT scan of somebody's chest. And you can kind of see where they've been shot. GSW, the black part is the lungs, the white is the vessels in the lungs. And this is penetrating wound through and through. That's the blast pattern with some bleeding around it. Pretty significant. One of the things to think about with penetrating trauma, anything that is <clears throat> below the nipple line could be chest or belly wound. So always be concerned about a mixed picture there. Don't just think that if somebody shot bladder on the chest wall, it's just the lungs, it could also penetrate the liver, knock out the spleen, do a lot of injuries. In this video, I can't get pull up, it's restricted, but it's pretty cool. It shows how you decompress the tension pneumothorax. And this is another toxicology case. This is acute lead poisoning. I uh, get it, lead poisoning. Thank you for smiling. And nah, I still can't get to pull up. Oh, they've been going since eight o'clock. The way we manage uh, penetrating trauma, hemorrhagic shock in the hospital is just like you guys can. We use TXA. So no. TXA was approved two years yes. ago, pre hospital use. It's a pretty good drug. Um, the dose has recently changed from one gram to two grams. It's about 20 bucks a gram to give, so it's pretty economical. Um, I would argue that if you work in the inner city and you have a three minute transport time to a hospital, maybe you don't have to carry it. And I would argue really big that if you work in the rural area, better investment is blood products for your patients that have trauma. The problem with that is cost is storage, good? and there's no blood out there right now. You have a big shortage of blood even in the hospitals. But TXA is great. There are limited risks to this drug. The way TXA works, do I have a sign? Nope, we got inappropriate humor. Um, the way TXA works 
is um, when your body has an injury and a vessel was torn, the body sends cells to that area to try to clot it off and make it better. Then in a few minutes, they send more cells around there to look to say, okay, can I remove these proteins that clot the blood and use them somewhere else? So you get a clot, it breaks it down, the body remakes it every few minutes. TXA makes the body stop breaking down that clot so you don't wear out your clotting factors. So that's how this works. It doesn't restore volume, it doesn't help you breathe better, but what it does is it makes your body not break down your clots so that you don't bleed as much. So TXA works pretty good. Only big risk would be sometimes you get hypotension with it if you give it too fast. But I would argue that if somebody's already hypotensive and tachycardic because they're bleeding out, you take that risk and they get the two grams of TXA. Our state says you give it over 20 minutes. I'm hoping we change that in the next protocols that are coming out. Um, there's some states that actually give this stuff IV push. But either way, if you're not carrying TXA, you have questions about it, please reach out to me. Um, it can be a lifesaver, pretty good drug out there. And that's inappropriate humor. That one I won't keep up long. Might get in trouble. All right. Yes, ma'am. It is for now. Hopefully we'll go to advanced EMT soon, but right now it's the medic level. Yes, ma'am. And again, we used to be one gram. Uh, now we say two grams. If you only carry one gram, don't think you can't give it. One gram used to work fine, right? So we can still do it. We'll get the second gram at the trauma center. But uh, limited risk, great drug. Um, I would argue if you have to ration drugs, that's one you don't ration, you keep that one. So TXA is pretty useful, in my opinion. This is an 11-year-old female, complaints of abdominal pain, urinary incontinence, now severe vaginal pain. She appears uncomfortable, intermittently screaming. Blood pressure is 140 over 60, heart rate's in the 130s. She's breathing way fast, but her sats are fine. Not really working hard, but just huffing and puffing. What could be going on with this chick? I can't say chick, this, this patient. Could be septic, yeah, the tachycardic. Blood pressure is up a little bit, so that kind of goes against it. But in Alabama, everybody's hypertensive, right? <laughs> so, but she's 11, vaginal, abdominal pain. What else could be going on with her? I know what you're thinking. Yeah, she could be pregnant, right? Yeah, the last delivery I got in the hospital was an 11 year old, right? So. There's kind of a joke that the, the residents laugh at me sometimes, but I check pregnancy tests on anybody from like nine to 90. Don't care. It's a dollar test. It gives me a lot of data. I don't really check an 80 year old. OK, but up to 60, I will. Cool. So um, normally I say we never look below the waistline on anybody. All right. In the pre hospital world keeps you out of trouble. Uh, but if I got an 11 year old belly pain that looks a little bit enlarged or gravid, and she has vaginal pain, somebody's gonna have to look to see what's going on, right? Is there a delivery that's imminent? If you ask this 11 year old, are you pregnant? What are they gonna say? No. If you ask the mama, what are they gonna say? No way, right? But I tell you, it happens. So this patient, I'm gonna sit them up right, okay? If I'm ALS, somebody's starting an IV. If I'm not sitting up right, they're getting some supplemental or pre oxygenation. I'm making sure I get a chaperone, whether it be a, my EMT partner or whatever and we're taking a look to see what we got, right? And if that's what we see now, what do we do? Right, well, actually, I'd probably use profanity first. I would say something inappropriate that I can't say out loud, uh, but my brain's gonna be cussing because I got an 11 year old fix and deliver, you know, on the couch at their house with their mom, dad, grandma, and everybody else watching, right? So how do you prepare for this? What do you do to get prepared? You said grab the OB kit. What else are you gonna do after you cuss and grab the OB kit? Yeah, so ALS, IV access, but I say probably you don't have time if you see the crowning at that point. So pants off this person, they're gonna lay down. You can bring their knees way up high, okay? Uh, good news is uh, 11 that had no prenatal care was probably gonna be a small baby and easy to deliver, right? Bad news is, it's an 11-year-old having a baby with no prenatal care, and you're doing it, right? So, knees back, <clears throat> right? O2, if you're ALS, IV access, if you have time, gloves on, OB kit open, you're getting ready for a delivery, right? <clears throat> Once the head is delivered, what's the thing we're going to do? So, hands are down there, 
I'm going to put my hand on the crowning part of the baby that's coming out to slow descent. So if the baby pops out, it doesn't tear and hurt the mother. Okay. You also want to slow it down so the baby doesn't have problems transitioning to life outside the womb. So hand is on the head. I'm slowing the, the descent out. Once the head is delivered, okay, I'm going to take a towel, glove, napkin, part of the pants, whatever I got, wipe the baby's face. We used to talk about grabbing a bulb syringe and suction in that. In reality, if you can do it, great. But the odds are, if I'm doing delivery by myself, there's no way that's going to happen. I got too many things going at once. So I'm going to wipe the face clean, slow descent. All right. Knees are pulled back far from the mom so the baby can come on out. So I'm slowing the descent. Head is delivered. I'm wiping the face. I'm still using profanity. My partner is opening up the OB kit at this point so I can get the cords, the scissors, and maybe the scalpel. Most of the time, these things come out very well. If the baby is stuck, again, things that help you is knees up and have mom push really hard. Bring those knees, flex them back as far as you can. Once the baby is delivered, <clears throat> all right, you want to wipe off as long as baby is not blue and they're making sounds, wipe them off, gentle stimulation, give them to mom. Then we got to clamp and cut that cord, right? When baby is delivered, don't hold the baby up high. What happens when you do that? Besides, I drop them. <laughs> the blood runs out, right? So keep them at the level of the, the vagina. All right. Clamp the cord. Cut in between. Stimulate. Hand to mom. And go back to mom at that point in the game. All right. So a lot of times these placentas come out pretty quick. You can do gentle pressure on the cord. All right. There's going to be a good bit of blood loss. And how do you control blood loss postpartum? Once I put this out, what can you do? Fundal massage, right. So I can tell you right now, nobody in this room is going to massage hard enough or as hard as the OB doctors do. All right. So we talk about uh, being gentle. There's no gentleness here. So your fist, the super pubic, and you're going hard massage. You want that uterus to constrict and clamp down so they don't bleed out on you. All right. Uh, sometimes in the OB room, if somebody's having a, a boggy uterus and they're bleeding, the OB docs are doing a two-handed. They got one hand on the inside, one hand on the outside, trying to make that uterus constrict down. I don't recommend doing that in the field, and there's your patient is dying in front of you. Heart rate's 160, blood pressure is 70. They're altered, they're confused, massive bleeding. You got to constrict that down, so you can do aggressive fundal massage. If you're ALS, you got Pitocin, you got IV fluids. You also have a drug we just mentioned, which was TXA. Works great. It was first approved for vaginal bleeding. Uh, before it's approved for anything else. So post delivery care. Clamp the cord, cut the cord, stimulate the baby. If baby is breathing, everything looks well, they go to mama. OK, if they can actually get on the breast and start doing that, that stimulates Pitocin or oxytocin works great. OK, if the kid is blue and sick, now you got bad problems. You got a sick baby and a sick mama. So now you definitely need help. All right, somebody's going to need to ventilate that kid and somebody manages the mom as well. All right. What about APGAR scores? You got to do those. For documentation, you do. But I can tell you right now, the APGAR is something I put down at the end of the day when I'm doing my chart. I'm not worrying about it during the procedure. I'm worried about taking care of that baby and that mom. We'll do one more case, then we'll take a break. Um, so for clarification, this is a, a dude's neck. This is not a groin. That's his ear. That's his beard. So you put up on scene, this guy sit on the curb. He's got this big laceration. He says his buddy cut him for no reason. What are you going to do for this guy? After you use profanity, I use a lot of profanity in my mind. I need to work on that. Yeah, so I would say that if I show up on scene, this guy's sitting on the curb and I got this wound and he's talking to me, he's sitting upright and he's not bleeding, I'm going to say, hey, man, my name's Ferguson. Come on, let's go hop over to the rescue, right, if I'm a transporting unit. If I'm not a transporting unit, I'm going to be walking up saying I need a transport unit here right now, right? I say if it's not bleeding, I'm not going to poke it or prod it. Dude either got lucky and it didn't hit anything or he got lucky and it's already clotted off. And if I poke it or prod it, it can start bleeding again. 
all right? Now, it changes. If I show up on scene and this guy's diaphoretic, leaned over, and it's pouring blood out, everything changes, right? I'm still calling for transport if I'm not a transport, except now I'm down there, I got gloves on, fingers in the hole. I'm trying to occlude this vessel from bleeding out, right? I'm going to pack it gently with some 4 by 4 some combat gauze. If I have TXA, somebody's hanging that, I can also put TXA on a 4 by 4 TXA works great topically. I use it for nosebleeds. I pack cancers that were bleeding before. Works great, all right? Am I going to put a tourniquet on the neck? We talked about that earlier. No, you can't do that. That'd be poor form, all right? Uh, so massive hemorrhage control. If it's bleeding, if it's not bleeding, I'm not going to do anything. Textbook says you put an occlusive dressing over it, all right? So you don't get air into the wound, etc. I would argue that if it's not bleeding, I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to get transport, move to the hospital. If it starts bleeding, then I'm going to aggressively treat it. Uh, that guy needs to be seen at a, at a trauma center if you got one. Uh, years ago, that guy would always go to the OR. He would get intubated in the E hospital. He goes to the OR and we explore that wound, even if it's not bleeding. Nowadays, we just get a CAT scan, a CT angiogram. We look for vessel, vessel damage. Uh, but still, that's got to be fixed by a vascular surgeon or a trauma surgeon. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, penetrating injury to the neck. Sure would. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yep, yep. Because you know, every, all the landmark, everything in the neck is high yield, right? Everything is dangerous. There's the esophagus, the trachea. Usually with a tracheal injury, you're going to see sub-Q air. But yeah, that's that's got to go to a trauma center. Yes, sir. Unfortunately. All right, let's take, a, let's take a break. We'll come back and talk about the rest. Any questions online before we break break, Chief? No, sir, no questions right now. Okay. Um, for everybody online, uh, the link to the attendance form is in the chat box. Uh, if you're watching on your phone, can't get to the chat box, you can send an email to alabamaemschallenge at gmail.com. You'll get an automated reply with a link to the attendance form. Everybody who attends needs to individually fill out an attendance form to get the proper credit. And even if you don't need the credit, please fill out the form anyway because it gives us a chance to hear your feedback and uh, we're always trying to improve this education. So thank you and we'll be back here in just a couple of minutes. We uh, talked a little bit about head injuries, um, whether you're an EMT, an advanced or a medic, you need to have an understanding of kind of the way we manage these different types out there. Um, I know through TCC, when you put somebody in the system, um, in the trauma system that you always get a feedback sheet uh, from the hospital kind of gives you some data. Uh, the data they get back is kind of limited, but a lot of times they'll say, you know, patient has a SDH or a, a, a diffuse axonal injury and people are like, what does that mean? What's the outcome for that? Um, hopefully in the future we can get better feedback to the guys in the field to take care of these patients so you kind of understand what's going on. Um, but when I think about head injuries, I think about a couple of types. I think about subdurals, epidurals, and then you got the intracerebral, which is kind of just a catch-all, and then diffuse axonal injury. We're we'll talking a little about herniation as well, because that's hit pretty heavy in the textbooks. And people think about herniation and different ways to manage the patient, even though herniation is usually <laughs> in game. Um, so on this slide, the top slide there, and this is a CAT scan that we use to diagnose these to kind of give us the answer. You can look at somebody clinically and get an idea of what type of injury they probably have. Uh, but I've been tricked so many times. The only way to really determine is with a CT. Just like with strokes, it's hard to say, is this a ischemic or hemorrhagic stroke? I can look at somebody and say, yeah, I'm going to bet it's, you know, it's ischemic, uh, but that is still only about an 80% guess. Um, so the, diff the the way the diagnosis is the case. So the top one here, if this is a CT, the way you look at a CT is the patient's head is into the screen, feet are coming out, and they're looking up. So this is part of the brain. This is a subdural. White inside the brain is blood, is fluid. It could be other fluids, but in the setting of trauma, it's blood, right? An epidural is nice and smooth. This is blood that's intracerebral. It could be from a contusion, an aneurysm, or a hemorrhagic stroke. Either way, it's pretty bad, all right? We don't see diffuse axonal injuries on a CT. That's diagnosed by the we get a scan and somebody is completely altered. GCS is three. They have head trauma, blood. It's potentially diffuse axonal injury versus anoxia. 
So Crane has this layer of dura. I call it kind of organic saran wrap. It's a thick membrane between the skull and the brain itself. There are vessels that run through there. Let's see if I got a picture of that. No. Vessels that run through there, right? So those vessels, they get tugged or by the brain moving around from an injury, and those vessels break. You get a subdural. So you get a regular shaped bleed between the dura and the skull. And that's why that's irregular. Epidural, which is above this dura, is using arterial injury. There's arteries that run through there, and that's usually from a skull fracture. Classically, we talk about that's some of this hit lateral and temporal bone. I get a fracture bone, it fractures that artery, and you get a big epidural. And that's this big area right here that's nice and smooth. So that's how I can tell on a scan if it's a subdural or epidural. Below the dura is rough, irregular. Above the dura is nice and smooth. These are venous bleeds. These are arterial. If I see this on a scan in the ER, this patient should have been in the operating room probably 30 minutes ago. We're behind the eight ball, all right? These, sometimes you can watch for a while. Sometimes we drain them, sometimes we don't. It depends on the patient. These, not much we can do. I can't drill through the skull and pull that blood out because I go through brain tissue to get there, and that's poor form, right? You don't want to destroy the brain to help save the brain. So these are tough. On all these cases, we want to prevent worsening of the injury and further bleeding. We'll talk about that here in a second. The epidural is above that dura, usually arterial. They always go to the operating room. Subdurals are below the, below the dura. Sometimes they go, it just depends on the presentation. Intracerebral, the goal there is prevent continued bleeding and get them into some long-term rehab and hopefully they do fine. Again, that's the subdural because it's irregular and rough looking. Diffuse axonal injury is when the brain is shaken or sheared so much that what happens is the nerve cell separates from its axon. So this is torn between the gray and the white matter. This does not regenerate. These people do very poorly long-term. This is diagnosed by MRI a couple of days after the event and by the fact that we have some of the GCS or three and they don't get better and we can't find out why. So the goal of any head injury, whether it's a subdural, epidural, intracerebral, or even if you think it's a diffuse axonal, is preventing secondary injury. If the brain is injured, gets a contusion, bleeds inside of it, that part of the brain is gone. We can't fix it. No surgery can fix that. So the goal is to prevent worsening injury. Years ago, we used to hyperventilate people with head injuries. And the goal was when you hyperventilate somebody, you cause vasoconstriction on the blood vessels in the brain. So therefore you get less brain edema and bleeding into the brain so it doesn't swell as bad. The problem with that is when you constrict those blood vessels, the part of the brain that was not initially injured gets injured. So you really actually make them worse. There's a guy named Spate out in, uh, where's he at? I wanna say Las Vegas maybe, who's done some pretty good studies looking at head injuries. It talks about hyperventilating people with head injuries actually uh, worsens outcome long term. So because of that, we don't hyperventilate anybody with a head injury anymore, okay? You get that CO2 less than 30, pull off that CO2, you get bad vasoconstriction, you have bad outcomes. People say, what about herniation? So we still teach classically that if somebody is herniating right in front of you, you hyperventilate them to prevent the herniation, all right? So signs of herniation would be a rapid onset of a change in neurological status, maybe one pupil fixed, the other one not, all right? And now they're altered, obtunded, okay? I would argue that if someone is herniating and they're herniating at a level one trauma center in the trauma bay in front of a neurosurgeon, their outcome is gonna be death. The only time you can prevent and save somebody from herniation is if they're about to herniate and you take the skull off and do it right then. Once you herniate, that part of the brain is gone, okay? So my argument for that, therefore, is that we never hyperventilate somebody in the field. If they're herniating for you in the field, they're not gonna survive to the hospital. If they're not herniating and you think they are and you hyperventilate them, you're taking their chance away of having a good outcome. 
So we should never hyperventilate anybody with a head injury. Now, things that we do want to do, we want to prevent hypoxia. So those guys need oxygenation. So they get supplemental or pre-oxygenation, whatever you want to call it, to keep their stats up. If it takes a non-rebreather, great. If it takes a nasal trumpet with an O2 candy that's shoved in it at 15 liters, great. You want to prevent hypoxia, but you do not want to hyperventilate them. You should be using waveform capnography if you're using a biad or an ET tube. If not, and you have the nasal capnography and you can't get an airway, or they don't need the airway at that point, or you're not a medic, you can put your nasal capnography on there and watch your entire CO2. It should not get this than 30, okay? One of the things I do with some of the flight programs I work with is I'm watching all these folks with head injuries on the ventilator, and I'm watching their entire CO2 for the entire trip. If it gets less than 30, somebody gets fussed at. Entitles less than 30 kill brain cells, defeats the purpose of what we're doing for these people. So you prevent hypoxia, prevent hypercapnia, or excuse me, hyperventilation. Two big things. There's also a big push these days about permissive hypotension. So we talk about, there was a lot of studies that say the guy that shot in the belly that is now, uh, blood pressure is 90, heart rate's 140. We're going to keep that blood pressure low, not raise it up with vasopressors, maybe not do anything, but get into the hospital for surgery. And that's great if it's penetrating injury on a young person. These, all these studies talk about permissive hypertension or hypotension. We're dealing with the military, young, healthy people. And that's not who I see in my ER. I see unhealthy, older, obese people for the most part, right? <clears throat> so low blood pressure and head trauma is bad. You got to have elevated blood pressure to fuse the brain. If somebody's shot in the lungs, has a collapsed lung, we can fix that with a chest tube. If you're shot in the spleen, your spleen ruptures, we can take that out. We can fix it. If your brain gets injured, we can't fix that. So we really need to kind of look at moving everything towards cerebral perfusion and saving the brain long term, and we can fix the rest. So I say that, that low blood pressure is bad. There's pretty good data that uh, no magical number out there. Every 10-point decrease in blood pressure less than 130, there's about a 10% worsening of neurological outcome with people with head injuries. So they're doing some new studies looking at this. There's even some people talking about potentially in hemorrhagic shock. Obviously, we're doing TXA, we're doing blood products, but those people actually may need vasopressors, a norepinephrine, a dopamine, some kind of drip to improve the blood pressure to perfuse the brain. Now, don't start doing that in the field yet. That's not approved for our state, but food for thought. We got to keep the blood pressure up to save the brain. That's the one thing we cannot fix long term. In an ideal world, would have four or five trauma centers in the state, would have rapid access to them from anywhere. Pre-hospital would have access to blood, the RSI, so we can manage the CO2, we can manage the oxygenation, we can restore <laughs> blood volume and increase blood pressure on these head injuries. One day we'll get there. We're not there yet. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, dialysis graphs. I've had some questions about these things. Um, so this is a dialysis fistula. We use this to dialyze people. So basically what they've done is surgically we've gone in and connected an artery to a vein. And then we let that heal up for about three months. And now when they go to dialysis, we put that needle in there. They get a high flow volume and we can dialyze them. Either artificial kidney, right? So this is a fistula. People say, can you access a fistula on a patient? I would say probably not. I would not recommend it. If they're in cardiac arrest and you're a medic or a critical care paramedic and you can't drill them for an IO and they're dead and you need access, sure, stick it. They're dead. You're not going to make them any worse, right? Otherwise, I'd say stay away from the fistulas, all right? Most folks, you can drill pretty good. A graft is different. A graft is where we go in, we take a rubber tube. Obviously, there's a fancy medical term for rubber tube, right? And we insert the rubber tube, one end in an artery, the other end in a vein. That starts the flow. And now for dialysis, I stick a needle in here and we do dialysis. Now, obviously, these patients, they get blood thinners every time they go to dialysis so that this doesn't clot off, right? And these are usually last about 10 years for that to be replaced. These are faster to use than the fistulas. And this takes several months to heal. Please don't take as long. Now, these I have accessed in codes before, before we had the easy IO. Somebody in cardiac arrest, 
dialysis patients, tough to get IV access on, leaves all stick. You can't thread a catheter through it. You actually got to hub the IV catheter, then pull the needle out, leave the catheter in, the catheter won't fit through there. Um, again, I would argue, don't stick this unless the patient is dead and you have no other access, no other choice. But if they're in cardiac arrest and you have to have access, that can be used. The problem is, once you do that with an IV catheter, they're probably gonna have to go back to the OR and get this fixed. So be ready to get griped at if you do that. But if they're dead and you get ROSC, they can gripe at you, right? Thank you for smiling. Good, tough crowd. There's some complications with these things. Obviously, they wear out. Sometimes you get infections. This is an erosion. I show you this because if you're looking at somebody who has a graft in there, and they say it's kind of oozing, and you see this scab, don't pick at it because if the rubber tubing is weak and there's an infection that kind of eats through that and you pick that scab off, what's going to happen? It's going to bleed like a freaking pig, right? So that's very bad, all right? These things leaking, direct pressure, quick clot, squirt some TXA, you know, and Israeli bandage, whatever you got works well. In reality, if this thing is pulsating, you're probably going to need a tourniquet, right? Tourniquet high and tight for that. And you can kind of see there's some pus in there. Very concerning. If that ruptures, you got a bad problem. These patients, if I see them in the hospital, I'm going to have to get imaging to confirm it's bad. But a lot of times I'll come and I'll put a tourniquet at bedside. If I'm really concerned, I come put the tourniquet on them. I don't tighten it, but it's there. So if I'm in a different part of the hospital and this thing goes bad, all I got to do is cinch it down. But you can tell there's some issues from multiple sticks. Big abscess under there makes you want to poke it and drain it. Don't do it. Uh, patient would die. And that's a tattoo of a big fistula, but it's a snake. That's pretty cool. The point of this is, just like in this photo, there's some danger underlying here. Be very wise. If someone said this was bleeding earlier and it stopped, and you look at that, and they think they're fine, they're not fine, they should go to the hospital. We need to get some imaging to make sure that's not deep into the graft itself, because that could be fatal. This is a thigh. So this is the groin. You can see the loop graft there. If someone has a dialysis graft in their leg, that tells you they've been on dialysis for a long time. We don't have any more spots in the arms left. There's nothing in the neck left to put a perm cath. So this is somebody with bad long-term disease. This ruptured about a block away from the hospital in Birmingham I was working at. EMS was right there. They brought her to the hospital. She was pale, tachycardic. She had probably lost half her blood volume. She was altered. We put this tourniquet on, cinched it tight way up in the groin. But the problem is, if that's the groin, the, lap, the loop graft stops right there. It's pretty tough to get that tight. When you put a tourniquet on somebody for bleeding to control it, they should not like you, right? It should hurt. Sorry, sorry, this is gonna hurt, hold tight. Um, you can bleed out in a matter of minutes if these things rupture. Obviously, they get TXA in the hospital. They got blood products. They have to go to the OR. This gets tied off, and they get a new one. But this can be life-threatening. I've seen a couple of these, and I would say that probably over half the ones I've seen that have ruptured in the ER pre-hospital, these people die. Not good at all. They got a lot of blood, a lot of plasma. They get TXA. And that looks very nondescript, doesn't it? Not super scary wound until you see it pumping blood out at 100 times a minute. All right. So this is a 38-year-old male called for an allergic reaction. He was working in the yard, dug up some yellow jackets. Anybody like yellow jackets? No. I hate those things. I would rather sit in a fire ant bed than mess with yellow jackets. So complaints of multiple stings, complaints of a rash and a pain, right? So we have protocols for allergic reaction. Uh, again, I'm a big uh, proponent that 
protocols are great, but the best protocol would be that you understand your scope of practice. You know what drugs you can give and can't give. You know your skills, you know how to assess somebody, and you put those together, and we don't have a written protocol for everything. Okay, I'm not keen though, but that's my thoughts. So you got a guy with a rash, he's wheezing, tachycardic. Is an EMT, what can an EMT do to help this guy? Besides hugs. Yeah, O2 works great. So a little bit of O2, sit him upright, move him out of the area where the yellow jackets are. I'm actually not gonna go up near yellow jackets. I put them in the back of the rescue, put them in your car, do something, get away from the bees. All right, a little bit of O2, all right? So uh, I guess technically you can't give Benadryl by state rules, but if the guy's at his house, you can say, hey man, you got any Benadryl in there? And he can take his own Benadryl, right? It's America, you can do what you want, right? So Benadryl is a great drug. It works on the histamine receptors, right? What else can you do for this guy if he's altered, heart rate's 140, blood pressure's 98 systolic, what drug does he really need? Epinephrine, right? So state says as an EMT, you can assist someone. If they have their own EpiPen, you assist them by taking it out and giving it to them. That's how you assist them. If they don't, all right, you need advanced EMT or need ALS, they need Epi, right? If the neighbor has an EpiPen, the neighbor can give it to your patient and you can assist your patient as the EMT with their Epi. There is limited risk to Epi. If somebody's in anaphylaxis, defined by allergic reaction with two systems, right? So respiratory, skin, now hypotensive, they need epi. There's no risk to epi for that. If this guy was 98 instead of 38, he still gets epi because he's wheezy, he's got a rash, blood pressure is low, okay? If he's got one bite on his arm and it itches and he scratches it, he doesn't need epi. This guy though, he needs epi, right? What other things can we do for ALS for this guy? Well, I guess we'll talk about, when you think about allergic reactions, um, there are different types. You can have allergies like runny nose, cough, cold kind of things we all get in the deep south. Minor allergic reactions would be a skin or respiratory, usually just one system or maybe mild and two, maybe a little bit of an itch, maybe a little bit of a wheeze, but doesn't look ill. Anaphylaxis is more than one system or ultramental status, diaphoresis, hypotension, those things. And anaphylaxis kill people. The way allergies work is the first time you're exposed to something, your body makes a response to it. And then the second time your body makes an abnormal response, releases a lot of mast cells, those burst open, you get a histamine response, you get hypotensive, okay, because of vasodilatation, and that causes all the issues. Anaphylaxis is bad. In kids, you're seeing the PEDS ER docs move more and more to do an epi for even minor allergic reactions because there's really no risk for epi in kids. And adults, I don't do that. They gotta have two systems involved or look fairly ill. This is urticaria, this is the rash. So just the rash and a patient that looks well, that's laughing, no issues, they're gonna get some PO Benadryl. If they're altered, they're wheezy. If they're hypotensive, they get epi, IM. What's the dose of epi, IM, anybody know? Yeah, I like that. So yeah, 0.3 mg for anybody over 30 kilograms. If you're less than 30 kilograms, they get 0.15, okay? In reality, my eyesight's really good these days, right? So they get 0.5 is what they get because I can see 0.5 better than 0.3. You might want to delete that part of the recording though, sir. Okay, thank you, sir. All right. Uh, I can't look up anymore, so. So we talked about at the EMT level, if he's got some Benadryl, he takes his own Benadryl, you can see him upright, you can apply some O2. This guy's uncomfortable, you call him for ALS, either the advanced EMT that has IM, Epi, or a medic, all right? And then when uh, EMS or ALS gets there, we can do some IV Benadryl, one mg per kilo, max of 50 milligrams. IV fluid is reasonable. In the hospital, this guy's gonna get steroids, from us. Um, the other thing they get is a H2 blocker, so Pepsid or Zantac. People say, why do you give a H2 blocker? Because Benadryl works on the H1, the histamine 1 receptors. Zantac, Pepsid works on H2. H2. In reality, the body kind of mixes those up and doesn't care. So Zantac, Pepsid, things like that work pretty good. Please, folks. Once you give Epi, that patient should be evaluated at the hospital. Epi is sort of like Narcan, it'll wear off at some point and they could have a rebound effect and have a bad outcome. 
Also, if somebody ever takes Epi for an allergic reaction anaphylaxis, they should have an Epi pen. So they should see your doc, get a script for that. In the future, when we move more toward telemedicine and you're able to telecommunicate with your med control doctor, maybe as an advanced or the medic and you give IM Epi, maybe you watch them on scene for a few more extra minutes and your med control doc goes to a telemedicine consult and calls in scripts for them. Maybe they don't have to go to the hospital. We're not there yet, but at some point we will be. So this is a 23 year old female history of asthma, a day of shortness of breath, no relief with home medications or menthol cigarettes. Uh -huh. And EMS arrives on scene. What are some questions you want to ask this person? What do you want to do? We kind of talked about quick assessment. Anybody with respiratory problems, I'm going to sit them upright. All right. Do a quick exam, the tachycardic, a little bit wheezy, sats are low. I'm going to apply some O2 for this person. When you think about questions that matter, the STMs for this lady, I would say big questions you want to ask is, um, you know, obviously what kind of health problems? You have a history of asthma or COPD. If they say asthma, two questions you got to ask these folks to kind of give you an idea. Asthma is pretty common in the South. People have uh, exercise induced asthma, allergic asthma, but there's some folks that have real clinically significant asthma. And those folks are usually the folks that get admitted to the hospital previously or ever been to ICU. So those are the big red flags. Somebody that's ever been admitted to the hospital or ever been put in the ICU, it's a red flag. They have real bad asthmatic disease, even if they're young. And that kind of changes my whole approach. So somebody admitted to the ICU probably has a 50% chance of going to the ICU again. They've been intubated for asthma. Uh, the risk goes up even higher than that. Folks who have bad asthma that ex actually get intubated, those folks have a pretty high mortality rate, very sick people. So if I get this young girl and I say, hey, you got a history of asthma, you ever been admitted to the hospital? If they say yes, my next question, you ever been admitted to the ICU? If they say yes to that, this patient is gonna get aggressive treatment with me no matter what she looks like because the risk for decompensating is pretty high. I used to ask people, you ever been on the ventilator? They put a tube down your throat and breathe for you. And everybody was saying yes. I'm like, what in the world is going on? And I realized they misinterpreted what I said. And they're talking about the nebulizer machine is a breathing machine. So, but those are the important questions to ask those folks. Sometimes older people that say they have asthma, if they're 40 or 50, I would argue they probably don't have asthma. They probably have COPD, right? Uh, pretty similar to the same. When you think about respiratory problems, there's oxygenation and ventilation. Oxygenation you can do passively. So you can put somebody on O2, crank it up to 15 liters by nasal cannula. Even if they're only breathing two or three times a minute, their sats will stay high, all right? A lot of times with asthma, you get oxygenation problems, but then you get ventilation problems. They don't breathe well because of the constriction, all right? And they gotta be bronchial dilated. Ventilation is controlled or uh, looked at by CO2. Remember with asthma, you get bronchial constriction. So obviously at the EMT level, things they can do, you can set them up, you O2, you can assist them with their nebulizer, all right? And the same way you assist them is if they have a nebulizer, you go get that, bring it over, you hook it up for them, all right? Dosing, the textbooks talk about the dosing is five milligrams or one nebu or one ampule. In reality, you give them the albuterol to either get better or to you get to the hospital. We talked about risk to benefit albuterol earlier. Um, but you can help them with their puffer or help them with their nebulizer, easy way, either way. We talked about the red flags, will be previous intubations or admissions, do they look sick or not sick? I've already mentioned before that even at the EMT level, you guys got to start making a diagnosis. Um, a lot of responsibility there. So conventional therapy, for asthma, for this person, O2, we talked about albuterol. If you have a dual neb, that's fine. That is uh, atrovent or ipotropium bromide. It kind of decreases secretions in the air sacs, works reasonable. Another drug people forget about is epi. So we used to use a lot of terbutaline, which is beta agonist. Nobody cares that anymore, but IM epi works pretty good for these bad asthmatics. There was a uh, young female that I took care of not long ago that was bad asthmatic, history of previous admissions, ICU admissions. She was pretty obese. It was tough to get IV access. So I'm doing continuous nebs on her as I'm giving her IM epi to bronchial dilate until we get IV access on. In the hospital, we're gonna give steroids. 
We can also use magnesium sulfate, which is a smooth muscle relaxer. Probably works better for COPD than asthma, but it's still reasonable to use. CPAP, BiPAP works pretty good on these people. And obviously at the ALS level, if they're critically ill, they can get IMFE, they can't get IV access, they can get IO, they get fluids, they get magnesium. Asthmatics are pretty easy to manage for the most part, but they're super sick. It's very concerning. These folks would die in front of you because of the lack of a, being able to ventilate them. So O2, inhaled beta agonist, atrovent, IM epi, we do steroids, mag sulfate, works pretty good. And then in the uh, hospital, another drug we use, or if you're doing critical care stuff, uh, ketamine. Ketamine is a great bronchial dilator. Uh, I say the only time you give that is if you're gonna able to electively intubate these people. It's poor form to give them ketamine, uh, and then you not be able to RSI them because you made them kind of uh, act funny and not breathe well in the state of their respiratory distress. Uh, but if I intubate an asthmatic, ketamine is my go-to drug. I use that for induction, and I also use it repeatedly to open the airways. Works pretty good. When you think about respiratory problems, I think about a couple things. Upper airway is croup, angioedema, foreign bodies. That's for strider. Lower airway, CBD, asthma kind of works together. Pneumonia, and it's just a lung disease. It's chronic lung issues. Talk about cardiac issues. Structural problems that cause uh, pneumonia would be pneumothoraxes, pneumonia, lung cancer. And we talk about allergic reaction causing those as well. That's a cigarette, isn't it? So when you start talking about people who say they have asthma and they're older, most of the time it is COPD. The management is about the same as it is for asthma. The difference will be that if you think about these older folks with COPD, IM epi may be contraindicated because of their age underlying heart disease. But again, if the respiratory problem is going to kill them and they're wheezy and you think there's a bronchial uh, constriction, IM epi is a reasonable alternative. State says folks over 60 or with heart disease don't give it. I agree with that. And if they don't look sick as dirt, if they don't make you uncomfortable, if you don't think that they're going to die in front of you, I'm not using IM epi on COPD either. We've shown those slides. Yes, sir. Hey, so we did have a, a question come in um, asking whether or not uh, the use of pre-hospital steroids are going to be included in the new protocols. Uh, yes, actually, that's a good point. I should have brought that up. So solumedrol is being approved at the paramedic level. Well, it's been suggested to be approved. Nothing's been approved yet. It was approved by SMEC, but it's got to go to the state. Solumedrol is a steroid, opens up the airways. Uh, there's limited risk to steroids in people with asthma or COPD or allergic reactions. The only people that would be kind of contraindicated would be a uh, someone who is pregnant, doesn't need steroids, it can induce some issues with them. Uh, and then if someone is a diabetic, steroids will increase their glucose and you can make them go into DKA. Um, so if they're critically ill, if your mind, you're using profanity and you think they're about to die or could die, they would still get the steroids because risk to benefit, they got to get them, but otherwise they would not. But solumedrol will be out there as uh, hydrocortisone, but solumedrol will be the drug that you would use. Uh, so, one, one more question. Yes, sir. Sorry, didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, the, they want to know, um, in the case of people who go into cardiac arrest from status asthmaticus or severe asthma, the chest gets really tight. It's hard to do compressions, hard to ventilate. Right. Is there any answer to that? Any treatment for that? Yeah. So with people who have bad asthma, COPD, and they go into respiratory failure, it's kind of counterintuitive. Normally with somebody who's hypoxic, retaining CO2, you want to ventilate them a little bit faster to blow off CO2 and increase oxygenation. With the bad asthmatic, it's different right? They can't exhale well. So if you breathe fast for them, you actually can make them worse. So it's counterintuitive. Those guys, you usually hypoventilate them. And if I have them intubated, sometimes I'll ventilate, take the bag off, and push the chest to help them exhale. Um, I don't recommend doing that for everyone because I don't want people getting the idea that we should not ventilate people at a, you know eight to ten times a minute. But with a bad asthmatic, sometimes you got to do that. Sometimes they're air trapping and you just can't breathe in. 
So you got to give them a break, pop the bag off, then I'm exhale. In the hospital, we also sometimes paralyze these people, so that way we control the entire ventilation ventilations for them. Um, in the pre-hospital world, it's still going to be, and even sometimes in the ER, it's going to be the IM uh, lots and lots of albuterol, uh, magnesium. Um, if you have to manage the airway, you want to keep them upright a little bit, and you want to think about the fact they're hard to bag, maybe slow that rate down a little bit, and every now and then pop that bag off. Yeah, those are tough. Very sick patients to manage. So. A sick asthmatic is concerning. The uh, other thing I was going to mention, Decadron. Uh, Y'all probably have heard the use of Decadron since COVID came out. COVID's that new virus that started a couple of years ago or something. Thank you for almost laughing. Yeah. Um, the Decadron is a steroid that we use a lot, decreases inflammation. Uh, we use it in croup, we use it in the asthma, we use it in COVID, we use it, uh, urgent care use it all the time for any kind of viral illness. You just get a good response. Uh, with that stuff. So you may see some Decadron coming out too. COPD is a little bit different than asthma. COPD causes uh, chronic lung scarring and you're, sometimes you'll see these blebs. So this is dark scarring from tobacco use, COPD, weakness in the lungs called blebs. These people, sometimes these blebs will pop and they'll get a pneumothorax. So I always think about somebody that's on BiPAP or CPAP or intubated for COPD, they're high risk for a pneumothorax. Treatment again, COPD asthma kind of all runs together, same pathway. Just remember that COPD, those folks usually have underlying heart disease as well because of their COPD. Building blocks to airway, again, like I mentioned earlier, some of the things that I learned as an EMT years ago, I still use my ABCs, right? Oral airways, nasal trumpets, jaw thrust. People should not lie flat. They should sit them up a little bit to help them ventilate, all right? O2 delivery, there's limited risk for oxygen in people in the pre-hospital setting. I know classically we learned that COPD, you don't want to put a lot of O2 on them, they won't breathe for you. However, if somebody who has COPD is hypoxic and working hard to breathe, they need oxygen. If they quit breathing, we can help them with that. We can put a nasal trumpet in and ventilate them, all right? CPAP, BiPAP, BVM use, intubation or blind uh, insertion devices. Let's see if this is a cool video. Let's see if I can get this part. So this is a painfully long video. This was a uh, house fire, inhalation injury. Obviously this is textbook carbonaceous sputum, right? But look at all that stuff. There's soot in there. For the medics and folks that have looked in airways before, you can recognize that this airway is hard to recognize. Everything is swollen. This person was just a few minutes from the hospital I was working at, a lot of airway edema. So you can see how this would cause strider, all kind of problems. Airway should usually be managed pretty quickly. You can do passive oxygenation. You can put some O2 on their nose, crank it up to 15 liters. Their sats will stay up a good four, six, eight minutes while you're doing this. But obviously they're not ventilating, so their CO2 goes up as well, which is bad. This is a good video too to, uh, to think about an eye gel probably isn't going to help this person. No, no way it's going to seal. Yes, no way an eye gel is going to seal. No way a king's going to seal. So I, I'm a big fan for the blind insertion devices at the EMT level or the advanced EMT level. You can't intubate. If you're a paramedic, you should be intubating people. There are video scopes out there that make it easier. Um, you should be able to do that. You should be trained. You should be able to be competent with it. Um, but there's, I've never sent a patient to the intensive care on a ventilator and a blind insertion device. But look at this airway. Look at that edema. Yeah, so that's the airway right there. Y'all see it? That's crazy. And again, this is super long. The other concern is look at the ET tube as it goes in. But yeah, well, and the cup was up too. So a lot of, a lot of issues on this video. And there's one more part I want to show, and that's right there. So a bougie. A bougie is nice. Once the bougie slides in, you can feel it go over the rings. If you don't, it doesn't matter. You slide the bougie all the way down. If it stops, you're at the carina. It's the right hole. If you put a bougie, a bougie in the mouth and it goes to the hilt, you're in the wrong hole, the esophagus. It's right hole, wrong hole, right? And that cup has got to come down. So 
kind of a painful video to watch. There you go. If it don't fit, force it, right? Yeah. Yeah, not funny. But again, airway management is something even at the EMT level should be able to do. All right. Obviously, EMTs don't intubate, but they can use blind insertion devices. They can do oral airways. People should not die from lack of airways. There was a uh, a reported incident of an EMT intubating somebody in our state uh, using a video scope. Obviously, EMTs can't intubate, so there was an error there. But the point to that is, with a video scope, it's easy. Okay, for the most part, it's easier. Anybody that's intubated, anybody with the IGL, a King Airway, you got to have waveform capnography. Um, I don't care who you are, whether you are a medic, a flight medic, a doc. At some point in your career, you're going to miss an ET tube. You can put it in the wrong place. Um, that's fine. It happens to everybody. You just got to recognize it and recognize it quickly, not when the patient goes into cardiac arrest, right? So you put a tube in the mouth hole, you got to prove it's in the trachea or that the eye gel is in the right place and it's working. You confirm it by patient should get better. And you got waveform capnography. If you don't have capnography, that tube should not stay in there. You should go back out, put an OPA, a nasal trumpet in, and ventilate. Putting an ET tube in somebody's esophagus does nothing for anyone. The patient will not survive, and you're going to feel bad about it. And those are the best case scenarios that will happen. Key points, any airway, anything you do really in medicine, um, when you do an intervention with somebody, you get to determine did it help them, did it hurt them, or do nothing for them. If it helped them, high five your partner, keep it up. If it hurt, if it hurt them or didn't do anything good, stop it. Go back, reassess, do something different. If you're not sure, that's when it gets kind of complicated. Right? But anything you do, reassess. Make sure it's working. All right, a few bonus things. So this is a guy that uh, had a fever. Uh, he actually got off the Greyhound bus where I was working, at the area I was working. Had a fever, <clears throat> didn't feel good, and had this rash on his hands. So had these nodules, both hands, and he had little streaks under his fingernails. Anybody know what that might be? So I think, oh, no, that's way too smart for me. I can't figure that out. I figure out West Nile when they call me four days later. Hey, your patient had a West Nile, you know? <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, so when I think about a Palmer rash, the three of them that I think about, okay? One is endocarditis. So if you got somebody with a fever, Looks ill, they got a rash in their palms. I would actually pull out my stethoscope and listen for a murmur. I don't listen to murmurs a lot, <laughs> right? But this guy will listen. If he's got a murmur, that's the Egyptians in the desert. Nobody gets that joke, but I love it. So uh, they were murmuring in the desert. All right, no, no. nobody went to Bible school, man. So I got a murmur, I got a palmer rash, and a guy, this is endocarditis. So this guy needs a big workup in the hospital. He's going to need antibiotics for about six weeks. Makes me uncomfortable. This rash here. This guy looks well. In his mid-30s. He got this palmer rash. Anybody know what the, the second palmer rash that makes me uncomfortable is? Anybody at the state conference last week? I showed this picture. Syphilis, right. Yeah, so a rash in the palms could be syphilis. Right, so I shake hands with everybody. I'm not scared to. You could have poop on your hand. I, I can wash my hands. If I see a palmer rash, I'm not going to shake your hand because I'm not going to catch syphilis by shaking hands because nobody's going to believe it. You know what I mean? So that's syphilis. And then the third rash, when I think about palms, is head and foot and mouth disease. Classically, we taught that only kids got this. In reality, both kids and adults can get it. So I paint this rash to the hands, and a guy with a heart murmur is endocarditis. I paint this rash on the hands on anybody else is syphilis till proven otherwise. And if you got a rash to the hands, the palms, that's painful, it's hand, foot, and mouth disease. I'd also go back, there's only three things that I think about with murmurs too. So if I got somebody 
having a big stimmy, a big heart attack, and I listen to their heart and they got a murmur. They probably need a cardiovascular surgeon, not just a cardiologist, because they probably ruptured one of the valves that makes me uncomfortable. Endocarditis is the other one, All right? And then the last murmur that makes me uncomfortable, if I got somebody that's passing out that has syncope, I'll listen for a heart murmur. And if I got somebody that tells me they pass out when they do exercise and they got a heart murmur, they probably have aortic stenosis. The rest of the murmurs, I don't, I care about them, but it's not gonna change what I do in the ER form. And same thing about palmar rashes. There are a few other things out there that cause palmar rashes, but those are the three things that I'll be concerned about. This is petechia and purpura. This is a vascular rash. So I push down on it with my glove finger and it doesn't go pale, it just stays red. This makes me think of a vasculitis. If this patient looks sick, they either have Rocky Mountain spotted fever or meningococcemia. And those folks can die pretty quick. With meningococcemia, you can die within four hours of the rash popping up. So this rash and somebody that's sick, I got my N95 on, I got gloves on, and I'm calling for transport, I'm moving toward the hospital. The state says that we can start carrying antibiotics uh, probably next year. If that's the case, the drug you can be carrying in the pre-hospital world, Rocepin, is what they need. Folks can die from that pretty quick. If they have this rash and they don't look sick, it's probably something else. It's probably something called HSP, restricted vascular viral illness. But it doesn't matter because this could still be bad. So they still, I got my N95 on, I got my gloves on, move to the hospital pretty quickly. There's some new things coming out at the EMT level if we get approved at the health uh, department. So the advanced EMT can do epi 1 to 10,000 starting hopefully next year in cardiac arrest. They can start using Versed nasally and they can start giving Toradol, which is a new pain medicine, non narcotic you can use in the field. So at the EMT level, we've added the BIADS, capnography, uh, a few things like that. At the advanced EMT level, we're going above the national standard with IV epi, Versed and Toradol, so we're moving forward pretty quickly. I know we all get tired of taking care of some of these patients. Uh, we see a lot of things in the ER and the pre-hospital area that are not emergent, uh, but occasionally we get the sick person and we can actually make a difference. If we're not ready, people die. It sounds corny, but it's the truth and you're gonna feel bad about it. So I saw this picture on Facebook. These are some cool toys, right? There's a doctor and the EMT, right? And now I know why I went to medical school because look how the doctor carries the stethoscope versus the EMT. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah, sweet. Yeah, inappropriate humor goes a long way, right? Uh, truth is, guys, in reality, I got three rules that I try to live by as far as it goes to patient care. Um, I don't want to kill people. That sounds corny but we carry drugs and medicines. We do things that can help people, but if we do them wrong, somebody's gonna die. Um, I try and help people do the right thing. There's some things I can't fix. I can look at somebody and say, yep, you got a head bleed, but if I take you to surgery, you're gonna not survive, right? So my job is to recognize that illness and get them to the right person, the right neurosurgeon, just like your job. Your job is to recognize sick or not sick, all right? If you're not sure what the not sick is, doesn't matter, you recognize not sick, and you move them towards somebody that can figure out what's going on. I do the same thing. And to that, the last thing I do is I go home with a clear conscience. And that means that I, I train, I prepare, okay? Uh, I, I don't cut corners, all right? And I take care of the person in front of me. So that way I know that I did everything that I can do. I can't fix everything. I'm gonna miss things, but I'm doing my part to keep somebody alive. And then the slide, the last, the last picture there on the right, um, we talk about uh, EMS or healthcare providers. I know there is an organization, uh, profession, we gotta do more to help you guys out as physicians. And there's the EMT organizations y'all got to as well, but calling you healthcare providers, like calling this guy a day laborer, right? There's a lot more going on there. Um, I appreciate the work that you do. There's a lot of responsibility. We put a lot of responsibility on the EMT and the advanced EMT, who only really have one or two semesters of training. We put ginormous responsibility on you guys as the medics. You get two years of training and we expect you to practice at the level of physicians in the field. So I uh, appreciate what you do, guys. I think that's all I got. Questions, comments, statements within reason. Yes, sir. Oh, yes, sir. Yes. Yes. 
Okay. Yes. Yeah. And it just depends. So if I were to fall from standing, okay, I'm not on a blood thinner, I'll probably be fine, right? So if I fall from standing and now my GCS is three and I look sick, odds are something made me fall. I had a big stroke or heart attack, something made me fall, right? And I smacked my head. If I'm on a blood thinner or something, I fall and smack my head, now I'm altered. There's more of a risk for bleeding. But any of those injuries can cause that. So a subdural <laughs> can cause somebody to be altered. I'm telling you to go to the OR or an epidural or intracerebral, any of them. I had one to fall off in the hospital bed and it was actually very low. And they wound up with a bipolar shift. Yeah. Yeah. So anything, yeah. And the problem is people with high risk for subdurals or people, uh, older people, you get brain atrophy. It just makes the brain shrink a little bit the older we get. You know, we do a lot of drugs and it puts pressure on those bridging veins. So small falls can make them have a big subdural. The good news is they have extra space to bleed into, but at some point that space wears out and you do get that brain injury. Um, well, it, it's tough to say. So for me, if I look at somebody and they're older and they've fallen or they're an alcoholic or malnourished and fallen and they're now altered, they have a head injury, I'm thinking subdural. I'm thinking an epidural of somebody who's got blunt force trauma to the head is usually they're younger, it's usually, right? Older folks that fall and don't have a lot of signs of trauma, but I think they have some kind of head injury, I'm thinking intracerebral, like a hemorrhagic stroke or a mass or something. And then the person who has uh, the diffuse axonal injury, you just think they have a devastating head injury, you don't know what it is. It could be subdural, epidural, and then we get the scan and it shows no blood. Then we think, okay, they have either an anoxic brain injury or a diffuse axonal injury. But from you and from me, the treatment is all the same. So oxygenation, don't blow off that CO2, try to keep the blood pressure up, manage the airway, and get them to definitive care, which is neurosurgery. So um, for the state, trauma entry at the hospital level. So if I'm working at a community hospital and somebody falls from standing and I see that they get a, I scan them, they got a big head bleed, I can't put them in the trauma system. I got to call around and find a neurosurgeon to fix them. For you guys in the field, if somebody falls from standing and they're altered, you're concerned, you can put them in the trauma system and get them to a neurosurgeon and bypass me. Does that make sense? So. Hey, Doc, yes, had, uh, just one question came in. Um, there's a little bit of side discussion about drug assisted intubation yeah. uh, for all medics, not just critical care. You, yeah. you think that we may be heading that way? I would argue no. Um, I think that if you're going to intubate somebody, you should make the intubation attempt as successful as you can, or the odds of success is as great as you can. Does that make sense? I said that right? You want to do it right the first time. So drug-assisted intubation, if I gave somebody a big dose of ketamine, they're not going to care what I do to them. I could potentially intubate them. The problem is they still have muscle tone. So if I go in there and look and I gag them, they can still vomit. They can bite, they can chew, and now I'm spending a few extra minutes looking around. Versus if I do a true RSI and I paralyze them, they can't vomit. There's no muscle tone, right? I get the best chance at a first look. The problem by doing that, though, is if I take somebody breathing four times a minute and I paralyze them and I don't get the airway, how many times a minute are they breathing now? None. So they go from a little bit of airway, a little bit of ventilation to none. So I got no problem with medics doing RSI. I'm very pro paramedic intubation, but you gotta be able to have a quality improvement program. You gotta make sure you train to intubate. You gotta have a backup plan. You gotta make sure you use capnography. I can tell you, if you RSI somebody and you intubate the esophagus, they will die. So you gotta have a way to do that. And you can pull up cases where this has happened. There are lawsuits and the lawsuit part doesn't scare me. What scares me is somebody dying. So. Um, I would like to see more ground agencies go into advanced practice to be able to do RSI, be able to carry blood. I think that's needed, probably more so in the rural areas than the big cities. Uh, but you got to have medical oversight. You got to have training. You got to have hospital buy-in to get your training in the ORs too. So that's the tough part. Other questions, comments? Well, we, uh, we got people wondering when they can expect for the updates to the advanced EMT standards to take effect and the other protocol changes. So. Um, they were approved at SMEC last week. 
they have to go to the Board of Health, I think is the appropriate path where they go through. So we probably won't know anything to January or February uh, is my guess. So, but if you're running an EMT program or an advanced EMT program, I would ask that you reach out to your regional office and figure out what the new changes are gonna be and start planning and get ready to train. So this is gonna be a big upgrade for the advanced EMT. A lot of education. Absolutely. As always, we need to train, but anytime yep. there's a change, I think training just gets that much more important. Right. The goal is not to hurt people, right? First said, give them somebody first said, you're not used to doing that, never had any experience on that, you can cause problems, right? Toradol, great drug. It's a non-narcotic pain medication, but it can't be given to pregnant people. If somebody has kidney disease and you give them a dose of Toradol, you can knock their kidneys out. So there's some risk to these drugs in addition to the benefit. I agree. Hey, Dr. Um, Ferguson, thanks for a great lecture today. Covered a lot of ground. And uh, hey, if you're listening online and you're in the Orange Beach area, we're at the War Convention Center. 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 Um, we're about to move into, uh, after a short break, we're going to move into a skills lab. Please come by and participate with us. If you're online, remember to please fill out an attendance form with the link in the chat box, or you can send an email to alabamaemschallenge at gmail.com. The password for the form today is rescue, rescue, all lowercase. And I think that's it. You got anything else, Doc? Nope, Good. That's it. December 8th at Brim's for Skills Lab. And then um, if you have not done the uh, eval yet, uh, if you're interested in podcast education, let us know. We're talking about getting the fellows up and doing that starting in January. Just quick tidbits of info. So thanks. Sounds great. Thanks, everybody. See you next time.